Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Design and Build. In this episode, we're actually covering a number of things. Firstly though, I'd just like to announce that my car and myself will be at the Mr. Land Cruiser show in Kabulcha, Queensland, which is on October 15th. For anyone that wants to come down and say good day, I'll be there the whole day. Footage from this episode spans over about four to five months and we just basically fix a myriad of teething issues with a custom build. We also go to the dyno twice, which is really exciting and you'll find out why we had to go twice. It turns out the car wasn't exactly in perfect shape after the high country trip. We ended up cracking a manifold and we go into the fix for that as well as a couple of other fixes from damage incurred on that trip. Just before we get into the build video, I want to announce the two lucky winners we have from our King Chrome Toolkit giveaway. I've commented on the previous video for the two lucky winners. If you guys can contact me via DMs and we'll organize to send the toolkits out. Thanks everyone for entering and subscribing to the King Chrome channel. Don't worry if you missed out on one of these toolkits, there's going to be plenty more of these giveaways to come. And that's one of the reasons why I partnered up with King Chrome because we get to do some of this stuff which shows my gratitude towards you guys for your support. If I could ask you all for a small favor before we get into this video, and that is to just hit the like and subscribe button, which will ultimately help the channel grow and hopefully lead to some more cool builds. Just down at Checkered Tuning today, so I've been getting the car ready for the past few days, and I think it's all good. It's full of coolant for the first time, among other things, and there's just been little bits and pieces which I've been fixing up, um, and hopefully not too many leaks today. So. We're going for a tune. I mean, it's more or less stock hardware and we'll just see how we go. I'll stress I'm not chasing power numbers. We're here primarily to make sure that everything's working properly. Whilst it is largely a stock hardware setup, there are a few plumbing changes and it's a completely fresh build. So we just need to make sure the car is running right so I don't blow up a motor. We're also here to calibrate the speedo since the diff ratios and wheel size are different to the original Falcon. And lastly, to make the car more drivable, we'll ultimately have to do some road tuning for this as well. But for now, we're just changing a few things in the Transcal to make sure it drives well with the bigger tires. Uh, we're on a hub dyno today, which is fantastic. So I had bonnet holder on my to-do list, but then I realized that the aerial is actually the perfect thing to do. It. Oh. <laughs> So a big boo-boo on my part was I had the boost pressure actuator lines the wrong way around, uh, which is not ideal. And there was also no map sensor in, so a combination of those two things probably could have grenaded a motor. Another little one was that map sensor there was unplugged, which wasn't ideal. It looked like it was plugged in, but it wasn't quite clicked in. So the engine was, uh, it was idling a little rough to say the least. So really glad I'm coming to tuning first and ironing out the kinks before we start driving it around to the top of the rev range. So I lost fuel pressure, just adjusting the regulator now. Classic coolant leaking a little bit from these fittings here, which are done up completely. So unsure why. So on that run there, we popped this elbow off, so that's a stock elbow. And I think that's quite a common thing to happen, but it had so much force that it actually blew an injector off with it. Having some dramas and can't get it to hold gear, so we're just looking into the shifter wiring. I've actually run down and got a new shifter over there. So we're just going to plug it in and just make sure that the shifter's working. So the problem is we can't get it into Tiptronic when we move it over like that. It's not referencing in the PCM and uh, we can't hold gear to do, a, to do a pull. So, you know, the car is pretty much tuned, but we need, need to do a few pulls just to, just to make sure, just to check over everything and make sure it's all okay. <laughs> So we just got done at checkered tuning. We're going to have to come back, unfortunately. The transmission wouldn't hold gear, which meant we weren't able to do a lot of the stuff that we wanted to. So the, the car's safe and it's good to drive, but uh, we, we haven't been able to get a full power run or anything like that. So 
This is part one and there will be a part two. Just testing the speedo out. Crossing off the jobs. I've been driving this thing around, I've almost got a thousand Ks on it and we're into the development stages of the build. And what does that mean? It means we're facing problems like this melted coil cover. So we built this custom manifold to space the turbo a little bit further off the rocker cover. Now, if you do run a flip manifold, it, it puts the hot side much closer. So I'm glad we've done that. So this hot side, even though it's ceramic coated, is producing too much heat and it's melted that as a result. We can't move it out any further, which is okay. There is actually quite a big gap here, probably 50 mil. But what we're going to do is get a Raceworks turbo beanie and let's cut to that now. Raceworks turbo beanie is on now. On a big turbo, I think it would affect the transient performance because it does trap the heat in. Uh, possibly not as good for the bearings, but I guess we'll see how it goes with the longevity. Um, I mean, I need it because obviously we're, we're melting this valve cover here and it means we're putting a lot a lot of heat up the top of the engine as well. So shout out to Raceworks. I had to give it a bit of a trim. I was hoping I could get mum to help me sew it up, but I haven't had the time and we're heading to Ocker. It's not always smooth sailing, so you can see under here the sump's off, so there was an oil leak. Now, I've never gasketed a sump before and I thought I did a good job, but evidently not. It was just a small leak. A couple of drips every time I drive it, but it was enough to annoy me. So the sump is now off. We're brake cleanering the surfaces and then re-RTVing it. So there's that. There's a coolant leak out of the heater fittings. And then there's also a leak on the transfer case as well out of this bolt right here. So we're fixing all that up. To be honest, on a car like this, I'd expect a lot of teething issues like this, especially with my lack of mechanical experience, so it's not a big deal. Just fix it all up and get back on the road. This is my rear view mirror, and, and I made a bracket out of 1.6 mil, uh, which is just a bit too flimsy, and it vibrates a lot when you're driving, and it does my head in. So we're going to bump that up to three mil, and then put some rubber underneath, and hopefully that solves the problem. Doing this sort of stuff is just developing the car. There's a lot of time that goes into it, because I'm doing stuff twice, essentially, but uh, it is it is going to be a better finished product as a result. You can see here without the center console on, I've sound deadened everything. I put a boot on the transfer case lever. So we're sealing up the car bit by bit. Another one for the list, we're just rebuilding my worn high mount, the 50 year old banger. So pretty much got it all done, but I went to screw in the motor and one of these threads is stripped unfortunately. So I'll get a helicoil kit. I think there's going to be enough meat there. We'll helicoil it out and uh, she's good to go. So the brake assembly, you finally got that iconic click. Which is nice, all the new bearings, uh, everything grease. I didn't really film a lot of it. I don't know what I'm doing, but uh, it's all, all good, I think. Time will tell. Go up. Go down. Putting in some diff breathers today, I got this Black Hawk kit. It was fairly inexpensive and it comes with a whole bunch of fittings and then this manifold block. So the plan is to plumb everything to this manifold and then plumb this to the air box, which will ultimately make the breathing height the top of the snorkel. And if we're getting any water in there, we're pretty screwed anyway. So I think it's a pretty good Pretty good system and you don't have to run uh, heaps of individual lines to the top of your car. Got the breathers going in now. Got the manifold block back there. Goes to the T-piece and then up to the air box. So I've got my trans transfer case and then the two diff breathers, all sorted. Just installed the breather port on the air box and notice how it's not down the bottom, just in case we get water in the air box or something like that and we've also RTV'd it just to make sure it is airtight. Got some car builders under bonnet insulation, so shout out to them for helping me out with this. We've got Staz here, we're using the RAM board as a template and we're going to put it under the bonnet, hopefully quieten it all down. I reckon one bang. 
Alder now gonna put it back on the car. About a thousand one hundred Ks on the clock now, and you can see that the exhaust has snapped. So obviously not ideal. I guess this was a prefabricated lobster back oval that I bought. Uh, I'm not going to name and shame. It, it, it is what it is. The welds look really nice on it actually. So that's not my work. These <laughs> these uglier looking welds is my work. The fusion ones. Yeah. So I'm I'm going to go ahead and weld this back up and then do a gusset on it. Not a big deal, but obviously this is the reasoning behind doing a lot of Ks close to home before we take it out on the track. Band-Aid fix. I definitely don't trust their welds. It's not pretty, but the last thing I want is this thing coming apart in the bush. So a couple of little bits of stainless will hopefully solve that issue. So when I started building the exhaust, I didn't really know much about building the exhaust. So I used a flex joiner in this configuration here. And I watched a YouTube video, Daniel Kissler's in fact, and I saw that when his got really hot that it sort of imploded and it restricted the flow of the exhaust. Mine started to implode, but it's probably roughly around the three inch mark still, maybe a little bit smaller. But I'm going to change this out and then I'm going to put a, a bellow style joiner at, at this end, a hard, a hard bellow style joiner at this end. And that'll be my third attempt at the exhaust and hopefully third time lucky. So I've, I've had to remake this thing a few times now, but that's all part of it, part of the loading experience. Got Chris from Barra the World here, just on a phone camera. We just put the can barra in, and we've got gear position for the first time ever, which is really exciting. We've also got some check engine lights and, and all that jazz as well, which is a good thing. And the can barra has really improved the latency of all these needles and, and signals, which is absolutely fantastic. We're back at Checker Tuning today for round two. Under the car now, and I've managed to melt my O2 sensor lead, which is causing some problems, so we're just switching it out. Hopefully we don't have to rewire anything. Just got done at Chica Tuning, everything's tip top. Trent had to keep it overnight for a cold start and we tested it today. We've tweaked the Transcal a little bit as well and it's driving really well. It goes like a bat out of hell in case you're wondering. Pretty stoked on it just quietly. It, uh, it put a big smile on my face. And now we're off to the four wheel drive show. In case you're wondering why I'm trailering everywhere, it is actually registered and it's, uh, it's a fully drivable vehicle at this point in time, but I am trailering it. Uh, in between some spots just because I don't want to pay for an uber home and I have a have access to a car trailer Which is uh, readily available. So that's why I'm still keeping it on the trailer. So we're off to the four-wheel drive show We can get some content and uh, Yeah, put it on display. Hopefully hopefully we get to see you down there So I've come straight from the dyno dropped the car off at the four-wheel drive show last night and we're Here for the next three days and then we've got to go home and fix the transfer case before its first trip next weekend so if you're down here, thanks for coming and saying hi. The timeline is now post shakedown at the Vic High Country. So we got back from the trip. I thought the car was all good. I knew there was a bit of an exhaust leak from the flange under the turbo, like a very, very slight one, and I wasn't too concerned. I did hear it, and it sort of got worse over the weekend. I didn't take much notice, but I got home, and I noticed a crack, and you'll be able to see it once I pull the manifold off, but there's a... There's a crack just in behind where the turbo mounts. For those of you who've been following along, you'll know that it's a custom manifold that I made out of steam pipe and obviously one of the, the welds just didn't hold up, which isn't great. Managed to wire brush a lot of the coating off. You can see here, there's a huge crack. Now, this was right down one of my welds and then it's propagated over onto some of my non-welds. What am I saying? I think this is completely my fault actually. So my first thought is to have another go at welding it and then also make a spare one just for when we get a bit further away from home and we don't have a TIG. I mean, having an onboard TIG would actually be the holy grail solution because I could just fix it up on the road. Yeah, I don't know whether I'm going to get it ceramic coated again. Here's another school of thought for you viewers. <clears throat> the ceramic coat reduce, reduce the heat by 30%, but it actually just traps it into this manifold and makes it hotter. Now, this is a highly loaded very hot component 
So I just wonder whether an extra 30% heat dissipation would actually be better for the manifold. In my mind, there's five reasons why the manifold could have cracked. So number one, bad welds. When I welded it the first time, I did a single pass and I didn't really V it out. Uh, and I think this is probably what happened. I didn't get the full penetration. Now, when I welded a second time, I'm going to do a V and then do a first and then a second pass, which is really going to give me proper penetration. So I think improving the way that I weld it will uh, will definitely help the strength of it. Number two, the log style design doesn't really allow for expansion and contraction. Now, the FG is pretty much a log style manifold, but optimized for flow. But the FG manifold also is made of a different material with a higher nickel content, which is why it doesn't crack. It's a problem with the log style design, uh, but hopefully welding it differently will fix it. Number three, running lean. The car was running lean before it went to the dyno, which means the manifold would have got really hot. Number four, ceramic coating. We've already covered that, but basically it's trapping in too much heat and not letting it dissipate as much. So by removing the ceramic coating, hopefully it'll let the heat dissipate. And number five, water crossing. So I don't think it actually touched the water in the water crossing if you look at the footage. Definite possibility that if this manifold touched water, then it could crack. So it's just something to keep in mind. So they're my five reasons why I think it cracked. I think it really is just number one, but definitely some of the others could have contributed to it as well. Yeah, let me, let me go ahead and fix it all up though, and then I'll show you how I go. Okay, so you can see here that I've double passed and weaved everything. Uh, not my prettiest work, but it's more well than there was before, so hopefully it's going to hold. Instead of ceramic coating at this time, I've just got this high temp spray paint in silver so I can see if there's any cracks. So I'm just gonna go ahead and spray it up now. Okay, so I do plan on making a spare manifold and it's a good time to make a jig while this one's off the car to make sure that these are in the same spot. So this is a pretty rudimentary jig. I've just used some tech screws into the side of my other jig and uh, just making sure the angles are all good. And then I'm going to take it off and then bolt the manifold back up to the car. All painted up now and ready to go back on the car. I've been using these flange nuts to fasten the turbo to the studs, but they keep coming loose. So I've got these from my local nut and bolt store. Now, if you can see there, there's like a mechanical lock ring, which is going to be fantastic. Obviously the nylock would melt at the temperature like that. And these are reusable as well. So I've yeah got a specialist nut and then the, hopefully the turbo won't come loose. Manifold's back on the car now, and you can see there that I've cut this flange which will hopefully allow a bit more expansion and contraction without crack propagation. So we're just gonna monitor it and see how it goes and then we're going to make a spare manifold just so I have the confidence to take the car a little bit further from home. We're diagnosing a driveline issue tonight. We've swapped tail shafts out. It still makes a bit of a shudder. We really have no idea what's going on. So what we've done, We've taped a king chrome light onto this lower trailing arm. Now, it does have magnets, but I don't want to lose it. It is a pretty nice yeah. work light. <laughs> yeah. I only just got it. <laughs> literally, literally only just got it. I've got a magnetic GoPro mount under here, and uh, the GoPro's on wide, so we should be able to see everything as we're accelerating. So we think under squat... Only is under acceleration, there's this shutter. So the only thing we can think of is that the diff's walking forward and binding maybe up here or... Something's binding up, but it's like when you're cruising, it's fine. It's only under acceleration. So we're going to see if this comes forward. See if one of the bushes is clapped or something. Yeah, I reckon, I reckon it's a ticket. Let's go for a drive and Let's we'll see how it goes. Run. So can, we, can you hear that, viewers? Hang on, under power. Can you? Ready? Under power. There. Close road. Close, close testing always. Under low, 
Okay, so we're just having a look at the undercar footage and it all looks pretty normal. You can see under squat that the drive shaft actually straightens up, uh, which is awesome. I think that the driveline rumble is due to bushes, so I guess this, the first step is to swap out all the bushes. I never swapped them out during the build. It was a big mistake. It would have been way easier at the time. So I've got the car in an awkward, precarious position. The back is jacked up off the chassis stands and then I've got mechanic stands under the diff. I'm just gonna pull all the links out, get the bushes replaced and then go from there. Here you have it viewers, I think this is a root cause of all my driveline issues. So the diff's just jumping around, these bushes are worn out. I never replaced them, um, obviously a mistake uh, in hindsight. Hindsight's a beautiful thing. So I just, I don't know why I didn't replace them. I guess I just forgot or was negligent. But I'm just going to go down and use a hydraulic press and push brand new OEM ones in. I did do these up when the car was at static ride height and I had all the weight on it. So I don't think it's that. I just genuinely think they've had um, too many Ks on it. So let's, uh, yeah, let's swap them out and see how we go. Just got some fresh bushes pressed in. So huge shout out to Phil from the four wheel drive shed for getting them done in express time. Big shout out to the guys down there. They uh, helped me out a lot. So um, we're going to put them back into the car now. Let's, uh, let's see if this fixes the drive line rumble and then we can go drive it. Yeah, mechanic stands out. Beautiful. Oh, geez. You've done that before. All right, and then, yeah, keep going up with the trolley jack and we'll get these solid stands out. Clear. Beautiful. Alrighty YouTube, we just put the bushes in and went for a test drive and that was the problem. The rear end's not rattling anymore, so fantastic news for me. Um, it was really doing my head in. Obviously in hindsight, I should have swapped the bushes out when I, uh, when I built the thing, but I didn't. So it's a sort of a lesson learned and everything's been replaced with lock nuts now uh, because those were coming loose. So it's good news, one less problem. Let's just talk about engineering now. I know there are plenty of people intrigued about it. I see comments about it all the time. I guess I didn't film any of engineering. The reality is it was quite a stressful day and I didn't want to be filming while I was getting grilled essentially by the engineers, making sure we met all the regulations. I'm a one man band, I don't have a camera crew and I didn't do any filming at all in the day. And to be perfectly honest, it was quite an important day for the car and I thought it was more important to get it through engineering rather than film and make YouTube content about it. So apologies, I know there are a lot of people that were looking forward to it. Just to describe the day, I more or less spent a whole day doing tests and providing evidence just to make sure that we legally met all the requirements. I guess the best piece of advice that I'd give anyone to wanting to get a car like this registered is acquaint yourself with VSB 14. That's the, that's the vehicle standards. If you build a car to that standard, you should be fine. It's much better to ask the engineer questions while you're building the car rather than building a car and showing it to them and then potentially having to do major reworks after the fact. So in Victoria, to get a build like this registered, you have to get it signed off by a VAS accredited engineer. All the VAS signatories have to work to the same standard, so I just suggest getting in contact with your local one as you'll be back and forth a little bit. That's all I have to say about engineering. It is all possible. It is difficult. It did take some time. There was a bit of back and forth, a lot of paperwork, and uh, yeah, here we are. We've got plates on the car, so I'm, I'm wrapped. So as you can see, viewers, there are plenty of issues with a custom build like this, and I'd hazard a guess and say that we're not done troubleshooting just yet. That's it for this episode, guys. In the next episode, we head up Rocky Track in Tulangi with a dual cab Unimog at the dead of night, and it was bucketing down at the time. It was a hell of an experience, so look forward to that one. If you like this content and want to see more of the build, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Cheers.